Hi, welcome to another edition of Trader Talk TV. Today I'm joined by James from Kemp Little Consulting. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. And if you could just kick off by telling us a little bit about yourself, Kemp Little Consulting, and what we're going to talk about today. Okay. Um, Kemp Little Consulting is an associate firm next to Kemp Little, that's a law firm, um, one of the leading tech and digital law firms. Um, and we have the consulting alongside so that um, the clients get the application and the law all merged into one. And the area I lead on, which is data protection on Kemp Little Consulting, has an equivalent privacy law team inside Kemp Little, and we work very closely together. And it's a classic instance where actually you need the law and the application to really match, because businesses don't just need a list of things they need to do, they need to know how to do them. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we know that the data protection law has recently changed. Could you just go through some of the similarities that are still existing and some of the changes that have occurred? Right, okay. So, the EU Data Protection Regulation, it's the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, it actually came in on the 25th of May this year, but there's a two-year transition period. So at the moment, Data Protection Act, the present UK law, is still in force. We've got a two-year period to actually turn around and get ready for that GDPR, which is actually quite a big change uh, from where we are. Now, you say, what are the similarities? There are quite a lot that has remained the same. Mm -hmm. um, the principles underpinning it, there are eight principles, things like keeping the data secure, only getting the amount of data you need, data minimization, only keeping it for as long as you need. All of those have stayed the same. They've added two words which I think are going to be really important in this. The first is transparency. Now, transparent is what it says. Fair, lawful and transparent. That's the first principle. Mm -hmm. well, it was just fair and lawful. So what's this transparent bit? Basically what it's saying is companies are now going to have to start telling their clients, their customers, what they're doing with their personal data on a level far, far greater than we've done before. Mm -hmm. So the regulation, which is more akin to a sort of continental model than the one we're perhaps used to. So like Germany, Netherlands, for example. Exactly. Yeah. They're much more prescriptive on how you go about it. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, to our eyes, quite a, a more structured and more bureaucratic way of doing things. And so the transparent thing is very important because a lot of companies rely, frankly, on hiding a lot of what they do with the data and the terms and conditions, actually it's going to have to change. and That's going to be a big change. So is it going to be more thorough than just the banner along the top or at the bottom saying you accept cookies? With an option it's, to view exactly, more Exactly, to, to want to look at it. I think different firms will go down it in different routes. I mean, if you look at the list, there's an actual list of what you're going to have to supply, how long you mm -hmm. keep the data for, what you're going to be processing it for, whether it's going to go overseas, all sorts of things. Different companies will go about it in different ways. Um, but I think we'll see some inventive ways of getting this kind of data across, which will be good, because mm -hmm. actually privacy shouldn't be stuck in a corner underneath sort of T's mm. and C's. I think some companies, and we'll probably come to this later, actually get an advantage out of this. But in the short term, people have got to start thinking, what does my website collect? And do I tell people clearly enough what it is that's on there? And I guess do people understand what I'm telling them? Very important. I mean, you know, sort of, do they actually get why you need different pieces of information? Mm. The way I suggest companies set up web forms is... If you actually get to the bottom of filling a web form in and you don't know why you've had to supply of information, that's a badly designed form. Mm -hmm. If actually you're relying upon hiding stuff from the T's and C's, this is going to be very difficult for you. So going forward, it's a way of actually treating the customers with a little bit more honesty and actually being clear about what you're giving to them in exchange for that data. Now, the second word, the second new thing, and this is a completely new uh, principle, is accountability. Um, and what they actually mean by that um, is he quickly checks he spelled accountability <laughs> correctly. Um, so accountability is all about actually proving that you have been compliant with the regulation. 
So rather than um, registering, at the moment you have to register with the Data Protection Authority in the uh, UK, that's the Information Commissioner's Office, and all companies processing personal data have to register. That registration disappears. Uh, interestingly, in the UK, probably the fee won't disappear, but the registration will. But the accountability basically is saying, how do you show us that you have kept all of the things you would need to do? How can you show all of the um, different things that we'll be talking about that you've got inside your systems mm -hmm. were working properly when the regulator comes to call? The big problem with this is, of course, the time the regulator comes to call most um, obviously is if there's been a data breach. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you've had a data breach, so something has gone wrong. So turning around saying, here you are, here's how we did it right, is going to be a little bit more tricky. But this is your plea of mitigation, if you like, mm -hmm. if you do have a data breach. But it's, again, much more systematic than anything we've been used to in the UK at the moment. So that will take a bit of getting used to. It means that compliance can no longer really sit just in legal, just in compliance. It's actually got to be out there in the business. Mm. Across the whole organisation, I guess, monitoring what people are doing with mobile devices, what other connected devices people are starting to bring into offices. We're saying data is the new oil. Well, that's fine, but at the moment... We're trying to sort of hold in our hands. We're not actually putting it in sensible containers. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to look after that. We're going to have to refine the data, and we'll come to that, cleaning it up to make sure it's useful to businesses. But we're sure as hell going to have to start looking after it more effectively than we have done in the past. Mm -hmm. And are there any other major changes that the, businesses should be aware of? Yeah, there are, there are a few things which are, are sort of structural things, if you like. There's the idea of privacy by default and design. Now, this is basically saying when you launch a new product, you're going to have to have thought about privacy at inception, at the very beginning. It's now, not just a, something you add on at the end. Yeah, exactly. So, um, one, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot more difficult if companies do do that and suddenly come along and start sort of trying to bolt privacy on the back end. But also, it, it's the starting point. So, the most obvious is, say, uh, a social media app is launched mm -hmm. and its setting is immediately public rather than private, or friends only or whatever. Mm. That wouldn't be privacy by design, it would be quite the reverse. So you're going to have to start thinking, what is privacy by design? Now, I mean, ultimately, the most private thing with that same app would be share it with nobody. But then it's a social media app, there'll yeah. be no point. So somewhere on that sliding scale, you're going to have to try and work out where your particular product fits. Then to ensure that you're doing that, they've got a thing called data protection impact assessments, DPIAs. Now, they don't have to be done all the time, but quite a large number of circumstances, which again are put into the, uh, to the regulation in tight control, you're going to have to have one of these DPIAs, except it doesn't tell you exactly what it is. It just says you have to do one. Right. So we're going to have lots of people coming along with lots of ideas about how to do DPIAs. But in essence, what it's saying is, is this product using personal data? Mm -hmm. what's it going to do with it, and what does that mean for people's privacy? Mm -hmm. And it just means that firms have got to start thinking about that as part of the process, and as part of the accountability, they've actually got to start recording it. Mm -hmm. So that when you launch the product, you know that the privacy is built in, and you can prove it. And so it's actually just trying to get people to start thinking at the earlier stages it's often the case that the data protection has been perceived as something that stops companies doing things. Well, quite a lot of the time, it wouldn't. It's just that they've come with the design so late on that the way it's being done isn't legal. It doesn't mean that there isn't a method of doing it that is legal. Mm -hmm. So people are going to have to start thinking about this. But the companies who can adopt this and get it right will actually find that actually it means the process in terms of the legality is actually simpler probably than it was before. So that's one thing. There's another which is process of liabilities. Um, at the moment, companies are divided into two categories. Data controllers, the people who are in charge of that data. Mm -hmm. So if you're uh, uh, the social media app, you are the people who are in charge. You're collecting the data. You're deciding what data you collect from your clients. Same with a website. What data are you collecting from your customers? They're the data controller. 
they might use a cloud-based service provider to actually do all of the software behind it, mm -hmm. hold the database. They're called data processors. Now, under the present law, the data processors have to follow the instructions from the data controller, but they have no liability under the Act. It's the controller's problem. Okay. So if they, the processors, lost all the data or were hacked or whatever, the controller might be able to try and claim some losses from the processor, but it's actually the controller's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Under this regulation, they both have some responsibilities. So a lot of people who've got contracts with outsourced cloud service providers will need to look at those contracts and probably renegotiate them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the big cloud providers are going to be turning around and saying, by the way, all our terms and conditions are changing as from mm -hmm. next Monday. Here they are. Now, unless you're sort of quite careful about that as a small business, you may find yourself carrying some of the liability that maybe you shouldn't do or you don't want to. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, stage to go through. Then you've got mandatory data protection officers. Now, again, our continental cousins are quite used to this. In Germany, they've been there for years. But for us, this is a new idea. Some large companies tend to have somebody called a data protection officer, but there's no specific description of what they should do, uh, what their responsibilities are, how they should be resourced, and so on. Mm. Again, this changes. The systems are put in place. It says a certain number of uh, things inside the regulation about what the company has to do to support the data protection officer and lists what the data protection officer has to do, mm -hmm. um, providing obviously advice to the company on the regulation, but doing training and awareness. Those data protection impact assessments, not only being involved in setting them up, but also involved in auditing them, going back and making sure that after they were filled in, mm -hmm. they didn't change the product completely and pull in something right. completely so new. Back so back to the accountability, accountability thing. Um, so there are sort of um, fairly major things for that individual. Not all companies have to have one. So there are certain, there are three groups. All public bodies are going to have one. Mm -hmm. Companies whose primary role, if you like, primary purpose is the processing of personal data. And how do you define whether or not a business's key purpose is controlling data? There are going to be three categories. Public bodies, automatically caught. If you have regular and systematic monitoring as, of personal data as part of your core activities in the business, you're going to be caught. Mm -hmm. And then if you have large-scale processing of what they call sensitive personal data, so that's things like religion, race, sexuality, health, uh, then, then you'll be caught again, mm -hmm. even, if, um, even if you aren't doing it as a core activity, as it were, just if you're doing large-scale processing of that sensitive, sensitive data. Yeah. So those three groups of people, those three groups of companies, are going to have to have a data protection officer. But even if you don't fall inside that category, in the end, you're still going to have to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So you may not have the mandatory requirement, but you're probably going to have to have somebody or somewhere inside the organisation who's responsible for taking charge of all of this. Mm -hmm. So recently there have been several high-profile data breaches. Do these laws change how businesses handle these? Yeah, it makes a big difference because at the moment, if you're in the public sector, you pretty much have to report them to the ICO. In the private sector, it's voluntary and the guidance is basically about a very high threshold. Mandatory reporting of data breaches comes in. But not only that, for, for all companies, so it's the private sector as well, but you're going to have to report it to the Data Protection Authority, the Supervisory <coughs> Authority, it's now going to be called, within 72 hours. Now, loads of companies are still trying to define during 72 hours what's happened. Mm -hmm. And also, it always happens at 6 o'clock on a Friday night. Um, so how are you going to cope? How are you going to have a system that can actually make sure that you're doing the things you need to do to actually stop the breach and identify it and close it down and at the same time be working out, do we have to send this off to the, uh, the, the supervisory authority? But also, the possibility is included, if it's a high-risk breach, that you have to inform all of the data subjects as well. So you could potentially be having to inform all of your customers about that data breach. So that's a big change. Mm -hmm. And 
you mentioned earlier that the law will come into full effect in two years, so there's a lot, obviously, that needs businesses need to change. What yeah. should they be doing right now? They've got two things to do. They've got to do a piece of gap analysis. They've got to look at their present compliance. Are they actually already really sure they're complying with the present Data Protection Act? Because if you are, that's a pretty good start. You've got to tighten up, you've got to do things, but are you going to be in a position in two years' time to have the resources in place, to have everything ready? That data breach is a good example. You might have a system in place but it's not going to necessarily be ready, fit for purpose for 72 hours. So you've got to start ramping that up. Mm -hmm. So you've got this financial year and next to look at it, do the gap analysis, get the resources in place, and make sure you're ready for that date in 2018. Mm -hmm. So finally, at the Kemp Little Tech Conference recently, um, where I saw you speak, you mentioned this new data economy. What's that all about? Well, we've all been talking, I was saying before, about sort of data as a new oil, but you actually need good oil. You need to refine it to get it right. But once you have clean data, once you've actually done the data minimization, once you've actually made sure it's accurate and up to date, there are so many more things that companies can be doing with data that they aren't yet understanding. There are, th there are a whole new ranch of services. Instead of actually assuming that the bigger the database that you hold, the better it is. The sort of, um, the sort of, if you like, the club card model. Huge amounts of data about your um, grocery shopping, but they don't know anything else about you. The individuals know a great deal about themselves. We know ourselves better than any marketing company can. And there are models being developed where that data that we hold is actually exploited by us, companies on our behalf, if you like, are doing it, so that they can actually generate completely new revenue streams that don't exist at the moment and change the markets, change the market mechanisms. Um, if you want to buy a fridge at the moment, you have to go and do the schlepping round. You have to go to a comparison site. You have to. There are ways, there are companies now being set up. You just say, right, I want a fridge. This is how much I want to pay. This is where I live. Off you go. And the companies come and bid to you mm -hmm. rather than the other way around. It's good economics but it could really shake up some very, very big market players in a very interesting way. Absolutely. James, thank you very much for coming in, and we'll see you next week on Trader Talk TV.